I'm Nora McInerney, and this is Terrible. Thanks for asking. And this is my grandfather, Austin Clifford McInerney. During the Great Depression, my grandfather was insulted by a man named Leo French. Leo French specifically insulted my grandfather's suit. What did he say? I don't know, it doesn't matter. My grandfather told that story to my father who told me and I am telling you. The stories I know about my family are not much, just little bits and pieces. I know County Clare, Ireland, Lake City, Minnesota, South Minneapolis. I know what I know about Leo French, but how much do I even know about my Irish Catholic family story? Not much, and the things that I told you, I only know because before he died, my dad got really into Ancestry.com. They all do. <laughs> At one point, you know, in his Ancestry journey, my dad asked his 90-year-old aunt about the McInerney family history, and she said she didn't know because when she was growing up, nobody cared much about old people or the past. Well, God does care. My name is Gava. Ga is Hmong. H M O N G. Not Hmong, just Hmong. And the Hmong are an ethnic group in Southeast Asia, including China, Vietnam, Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, Myanmar. Hmong people have no country of their own. And Minnesota has the second largest population of American Hmong people. Go us! So Ga is not Irish Catholic, <laughs> but her children kind of are. My husband is mostly German and mostly Irish, and so I try to teach them about German-Irish culture too. And, and so like I'm teaching them all this stuff about being Hmong, and I feel like I have a responsibility to teach them about Ireland too, and, and like the rhyme area where their grandfather is from. And so I, I, I'm trying to do this too, so we like make leprechaun catchers, and we talk about Oktoberfest, and... I just, I don't know if I'm doing a good job. I've never made a leprechaun catcher. <laughs> and this year, I forgot St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> I was like, why is everyone drunk? <laughs> so I think God's doing a great job. Aside from teaching her kids about their German, Irish heritage, God wants to make sure her kids also know about her parents and her ancestors and where she came from, which is here. So if you think about Laos, it's kind of like a long hot dog wiener that's like a slash backward sign, you know, kind of slanted in Southeast Asia. So it's a landlocked country. And so at that very top is really the like intersection of the Vietnam and China. And that's where my father's family is from, is from that little area. And that's really like where a lot of the war occurred. The war is, of course the communist conflict in Southeast Asia. And the US call our part of it the Vietnam War because officially that's where the United States engaged in the 1960s and 70s. But Vietnam is not exclusively where the war was fought. The places where it was fought outside of the official theater became known as the secret war. That secret war included Laos, where God knows her father, Pao Ying Vang, was born in 1950. Laos is where God's family lived. And this is where her father's heroic story unfolded. The story that God had always been retelling. The story that she had internalized and made her own. And it is so good. My dad was a young man in school. I think it would be the equivalent of high school in the United States. And as he is at this boarding school with other prominent, I don't want to say wealthy, because certainly my dad wasn't wealthy, but as he was at this exclusive school, this war, you know, was raging on. And in fact, it had raged before he even went to school. And then one day, some soldiers come to his school with guns, and threatened to kill all the teachers and tell the students that they need to get on these like trucks. And they do, they comply, they're scared to death. The trucks take them to a labor camp and he's put in hard labor. Um, he was 
very sad, very lonely. I mean, he, people were dying of malnutrition, people were dying of disease, people were just being killed um, for minor infractions. So I heard that he was scared to death. Somehow, word of the kidnapping got back to Ga's grandfather back in the village, who made the trek to the city to investigate. He learned that the Patet Lao, the Laotian Communist Party that was working with the North Vietnamese, had come to the school because they hated intellectuals and because students must have families with money. Ga's grandfather, a farmer, started paying people off. He found out about the labor camp and he organized bribes for the guards to look the other way on one particular night so his son could escape. Everything was as it was supposed to be. The plan was hatched. The money was handed off. And then on that particular night, my father decided that he was going to take his, like, six closest friends with him, you know, who are also in this labor camp. Okay, that's a big last-minute change. <laughs> like, a single prisoner? That's one thing. But a group of seven? The guards couldn't ignore that. So they were forced to chase the fleeing prisoners. I don't know if it was like a moonless night or I don't know if it was a moon-filled night, but I mean, they're, you know, running through the jungles and I've got this vision of my head, like, apocalypse now, you know, like people running through the jungle. I don't know. I just, I just feel like I see in my head, like, black and green everywhere. And I see my dad as a young man, like, you know, with no shoes, you know, and tattered clothes with like six other starving, you know, prisoners, like running through the jungle. Anyway, somehow he ends up like in this like makeshift landing strip so it's a clearing in the jungle and there's actually a, a small plane and my dad sees this european looking man so my dad's like running to this person and my dad's like we gotta get out they're behind us god's father yells to the white man in the colonial language of laos which is french and the man doesn't answer and the prisoners are still running and the guards are gaining on them so god's father tries again with the language of the most recent colonial power. He tries yelling in English. So my dad's like, they're behind us, they're gonna kill us. And then the guy says, oh my God, we have to get out of here. You know, and my dad could tell by when this person answers that he's got an Australian accent. And then my dad's like, I got money. So he's like, get in. So, and then he, my dad and his like, you know, friends all, you know, jump into this little plane. And as they're taking off, you know, on this runway, the communist soldiers who have been chasing them all night long um, in this like haze of green and black appear in the clearing and they're like shooting at the plane and this plane takes off just in time. <sighs> right? Like that story is so good, it's amazing. Like, that is the story that God told us. That is the story we expected. That's the story that, you know, got us to invite her parents into the studio so we could hear this story directly from them. Okay. My name, my name is uh, now Ying Wang. Ying Wang. Okay, Ying but Wang. you go by Ying Wang? Ying Wang. Okay, yeah. now Ying Wang. Um, my name's uh, Peng Ho Wang. Ying and Peng showed up dressed to the nines, and I was in a flannel, and I felt immediately bad about myself, and I should have. <laughs> I was like, make an effort, McInerney. <laughs> so after that, um, we got them set up, and they started at the beginning, which is a good place to start when you are gearing up for a big time, heroic, cinematic rescue story. First, Ying's childhood. Because my mom and dad is farmer, so uh, we live very f far from the, uh, the city. Ying grew up in a small mountain village. The, the house was made by bamboo and uh, roof is, is grass. There was no road, you know. You have to walk half day or a couple hours a day, you know, back and forth. At age seven, Ying's parents sent him away to attend school in another village. I'm crying a lot. I'm crying a lot, but I have no choice, you know. My dad said that uh, your mom and I is illiterate, so we want you to go to school and uh, read and write. 
His family wanted him to have an education so much that they sent a seven-year-old to a foster family several villages away because education was everything. And Ying missed his parents so much. He was seven. He said, Dad, I, I miss you. I miss mom and dad and my brother a lot. May I go back home with you? And my dad said, no. He's very proud. You know, he cried. He said, now my dreams come true. Because I have son who are able to read and write. Ying became so dedicated to fulfilling his parents' dreams that when the communist army of the Patet Lao came to his elementary school when he was nine years old, this little boy and his teachers and fellow students fled to the jungle to survive. They were there for three months, eating one meal a day, living in huts they had built themselves until it was safe to go back to the school. The communists fell out of power in Laos in 1961. In 1968, Ying is 18 years old. He has just started university in the capital city of Vientiane. And one day, he runs into a classmate who's doing his homework. And he said that, where are you going, where are you going, where are you going? I say, whoa, that, that guy must be crazy. What's that? That's maybe this Cambodian language? Oh, he's not French either. No, no, I, I, I approach him, I say, what's kind of language there? He say, oh, Uncle. I say, what's Uncle? Oh, you know, Uncle is American. I say, what's that? This is Indian? You know, Uncle language. Because the French is called English or Uncle. Ying is intrigued with this wacky new language. He starts taking English classes himself, three hours a day, in addition to his university classes. It's so much work, but he also has so much drive and so much ambition. Now, through all of this, war hadn't ended. The Patet Lao, who had forced him into the jungle as a boy, were still fighting to regain the country with help from the North Vietnamese. After graduation, Ying was one of many Hmong to join what was known as the Secret Army. They came from every village and every town, many as soldiers on the front lines. Hard to find people who speak Lao fluently, French, and English. So they, they test me, and I wanted the best, you know, yeah, because when you speak Lao, you're able to speak Thai. So very hard to find people who speak f more language. Because of his aptitude for languages, Ying became a lieutenant and then a captain. He had soldiers working under him. He was given command of the Longcheng Airport near Vientiane. Because of my education, I was in charge of one of the busy airports in northern part of Laos, Longcheng. I was in charge there. You were in charge of the airport, airport. the busy airport. The really busy airport. Okay. Then, in 1971, Ying received a special assignment. He was told to go over the border to Bangkok, the capital of Thailand, to meet with some Americans. Ying was given a list of items that the secret army needed to fight the communists. They bring a nice car, pick me up from the airport, and we go for lunch, and they say, okay, what kind of ammunition you want? Okay, tell me. Tell us. Okay. And so what would you, you guys need? And how about ration, rice? Ying delivers his list to the Americans. And now, his role in the war has suddenly changed. I've been working side by side with the U.S. government CIA officer. When did you first make them? They talk nice, but when you get it to the end, they say, Mr. Wang is very, if you open this to the public, that's it. He, he doesn't say you're going to be killed, but he say, Oh, they just do the gesture. Yeah. yeah. Just the gesture. Yeah. 
At these meetings, another thing comes up, something Ying's general hadn't prepared him for, something his general didn't even know about. The Americans ask Ying to do work for them because here's the thing, the US is not supposed to be in Laos, they're not supposed to be contributing to this part of the war, but the CIA is recruiting people like Ying to fight a secret war against the communists with the bodies and the work of the people of Laos. Now, you may be thinking, what did the CIA ask Ying to do? Yes. Perhaps he can't maybe tell you what he was supposed to be doing for the CIA too? Oh, that is a great point. <laughs> so weird that I haven't been called by the CIA to work for them. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Yep. <laughs> I'm still waiting. So Ying starts working for the CIA doing something, and he spends several years at it. He's really successful. He meets paying her, and they get married. And Ying starts to get attention, but the bad kind of attention. And one day, he is approached by a Laotian investigator. Say, we want to talk to you, Mr. Wang, you know, Major Wang. I was a major in the military. And I say, what do you talk about that? And then, um, because I'm a luckiest, an Australian guy. He happened to know me very well because when I went to maybe the CIA in, 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 in Thailand, he was there many times. Oh, okay. Came to me and said, don't talk to don't. If you're here for a while, he's going to call you and then take you away. So one of the intelligence officers who had been in Thailand when Ying met with the CIA was an Australian guy and warned Ying about having contact with certain Laotian officials who might be looking to drag him off to a camp. That is very lucky. It feels like we're getting to the point of the story where Ying should be rescued by an Australian, right? After escaping a work camp. And Hans and I only booked two hours of studio time, so we gotta get to that part. How did you end up in the camp? I have a chance to visit the camp one time, close to the capital of Vientiane. Yeah, I did visit the camp one time. That's it. Okay, so at, at one point, were you in a camp? I have a chance to go there one time for a couple hours. Oh, you were only there for a couple hours? Couple hours. Um, I don't know, I'm, I might be. Um, okay, um, can you tell me the story about the Australian with the airplane? You mean the, the, the Australian guy? The Australian guy. Who, 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 who instructed me not to talk to the guy? You mean, you, what do you mean? Um, I have a note here about an, it's like seeing an Australian with an airplane. Like, do I have that story wrong? Dad, do you remember when you, when you told me a story about um, when you were in, um, I think mm -hmm. you, you went to, didn't you go to a re-education camp? No, I, as I said, you know, I on the, they were on the process, but it caught me. But because of the Australian guy, yeah, you know. So you would have gone to that camp if it weren't for this Australian guy saying, shh, don't talk to that guy. Yep. That's very lucky. <laughs> It was less lucky for our interview. <laughs> and at this point, God's like looking at Hans and I like, I, and she doesn't need to because this happens a lot in interviews actually. We think it's gonna be one thing and then it's another thing. So here's what it is. God's dad was never kidnapped by the Patet Lao. He did flee them as a child and he lived in the jungle with his teachers for a few months. He was never in a labor camp. He did visit one <laughs> while he was working in the secret war with the CIA. He wasn't rescued by a plane by an Australian, but he did meet an Australian. <laughs> Again, while working with the CIA, and the Australian guy told him not to trust some other guys, which kept him out of the labor camp. Ying's whole family did leave Laos by airplane, but not after running through the jungle while being pursued by angry guards. 
they left from the airport <laughs> that Ying had worked at, had run. So it's now 1975. Ga was only a few weeks old, and the family had fled to a refugee camp in Thailand. They saw disease and hunger and death. They were there for five years. And in 1980, the family was relocated to the United States, to St. Paul, Minnesota, to a new home that was very far away from home. Ga's father's story is still an incredible story, but it's just not the story that she was expecting. So a few days after the interview with her parents, Ga stopped by the studio again, alone to just process that. When my parents came in, which was what, two days ago, and we had this taping, it really made me question everything I knew about them. I mean, there were some memories that I think we had in common it's almost like looking at a piece of, of the same puzzle, but from different perspectives, you know? Um, and then there were other stories that my dad had told you, Nora, that I had heard a completely different version of. And I swear on like my ancestors, like spirits, that I thought those were the stories. The story of the escape especially had become a part of Ga. She repeated it, she told it to us, I told it to you. <laughs> And it was almost as like someone like, like my dad himself kind of like just stopped the music. It shook like my understanding of like other memories that I thought I had with them and like the narrative of my parents or my grandparents that I thought that I knew. And now like for the last two days since I've heard this, I've like been replaying some of these stories that I've heard and wondering like what is real and what isn't real and like did I make some of it up myself? Maybe she did make it up. Or maybe everything God ever heard about her parents' escape to America got all mixed up in her head with some Tim O'Brien novels and a little bit of Apocalypse Now. <laughs> and maybe her dad did change the story. And maybe that sounds like it's not the biggest deal, but Ga isn't just thinking about herself. She's thinking about her kids and what she's going to pass on to them, or more importantly, what they will remember of what she passes on to them. Like her stories about being in the Ban Vinai refugee camp in Thailand as a little girl, growing up in a poverty that her kids can't imagine. There was a boy who I used to play with, and I was always very disgusted at him. You know how you have friends who you kind of like are your frenemies, even at a very young age, you kind of <laughs> like them, but you really hated them, and you put up with them. And so he lived near me, his name was Tu, and I guess kind of put up with him. And the reason why he disgusted me was because he had like welts all over his body, and he was sickly, and he was starving. And he was starving to the point where, like, his little belly was like a little balloon. And he always looked dirty and disheveled. And I just was really disgusted with him. But he was okay. He was an okay playmate. So we used to play together. And one day I went over to um, Tu's house because I hadn't seen him in a few days. I remember knocking on the door and his father opens. And there are, like, just a host of people inside his house just, like, crying. And I said to his father you know, is two around? Can he come out and play? And his father tells me two has gone to the garden. And going to the garden is a euphemism for, like, dying. And so two was dead because he had died with the most recent outbreak of whatever disease that had taken out um, a lot of, like, the people in the refugee camp. And I often think about two. And, and just, like, how there were so many people like him that died and how I, I witnessed it. And, and now I understand why I hated too so much, why I was disgusted with him. It was because he was a mirror of me. He was a reflection of me. I had the same belly. I had the same scars. You know, I mean, I remember 
We're in a refugee camp. There's absolutely no food. But yet I was going through the garbage looking for food, eating trash, and not telling my parents about it because they couldn't give me food. I felt like I had to survive on my own. And that's what Tu and I did. We dumpster died together. I was exactly like him. That's why I hated him so much. Because he was a reflection of me. I hope too, if you're out there, that you're okay. That story also shaped Ga. She wants her kids to know those stories, for her stories to become their stories and their kids' stories, so that they don't end up like me with a lousy story like, Leo French insulted my grandpa's suit. <laughs> but I feel like a responsibility to let them know about my experiences and my father's experiences and my great-grandfather's experiences because that's their legacy and that's who they are. I'm telling them these stories now, and unfortunately it comes out like this. My daughter is frustrated because her tablet is not charging. And she's like crying and yelling and screaming because her tablet's not charging. And I'll go up to her and say, what? And this happened when she was five, and I would say, you know, when I was five years old, I was just trying to stay alive, and I was just eating garbage, and <laughs> the whole works, and my husband would come and gently pat me on the back and say, honey, let's just try to get them through diapers or let's just try to get them to <laughs> kindergarten or like, I understand that was your experience and that's very important, but like, let's just focus on the now. They get to pick and choose. You know, I, but I just hope that they, they respect my mongness or their mongness. It's really important to me to make sure that my children know the stories. Memories like these are like an intergenerational game of telephone. By the time a story gets past the person who lived it, it's been altered. Stories and memories change as we do, with distance, with perspective. Some because of the natural fading that occurs around the edges of even our most vivid life moments, and some with an intentional fading an intentional emotional Photoshop, a little touch up here, airbrush there. Some memories change because we grow and our view of them changes. So what does God do with the more cinematic version of her dad's story? The one that she loved and retold. There's no documentation that God can point to to corroborate her version of her dad's story and really there's nothing her dad can really point to either. It's just that it's his story. So the facts, whatever they are, are his to share. And I feel like this is his story and he's sticking with it. I feel like I want to know more. It's not that I want to know like a different story, but it's that I know that he has so many more stories to tell me, to make me really understand, like, not only his experience, but, like, colonialism, you know, to, to understand poverty in a level that, like, I just can't see really here in the United States, which I did see a little bit of when I was in the refugee camp as a child. I mean, to understand war and death and obedience and loyalty, like, you know, just for me to understand more, I hope that I can give this, these stories to, to my children. I hope it will bring us closer in the end. This is why these stories are important. These stories belong to everyone. I know that Leo French is a son of a gun who insulted my grandfather. <laughs> and God knows what she knows about her family stories. I didn't know certain things. I thought I knew. And maybe I'll never really know, you know. In a way, isn't that like how family myths like happen? You, you think you know the stories and then it's like, no, it's like it becomes something else and it becomes like a family myth. Yeah, like this is the way that Hmong people are around their like their vendettas or like feuds. There's a family story and then it becomes a myth and then you're just told that you're supposed to hate that family. 
like I still hear my dad and other people talking about like family feuds and how we don't like those people just because three generations ago they did something like wrong. So three generations ago, <laughs> a guy named Leo French insulted my grandfather's suit. <laughs> That's my grandfather, my handsome ass grandfather, at his wedding. And that, next to him, that's Leo French. <laughs> my mom revealed this photo to us while we were researching this story, broke the case wide open. Like, what? Like, what even is this story? Like, Leo French insulted my grandfather's suit, or did he? Or, I mean, did my grandfather deserve it? I haven't seen this suit. My grandfather wasn't perfect. Like, we were poor, I don't know. Maybe the Frenches have their own version of this story and maybe on the other side of town, they're in a different theater telling a different version <laughs> of this story where Austin Clifford McInerney is the villain. We don't know. There isn't one single version of any story. Not within my family, or your family, or God's family. And maybe that's a good thing, because facts are different from the truth anyway. The facts of how Ga and her family got here change, whether the story is told by Ga or Ying, or by Peng Herving, Ga's mom. Pang has her own story about their family, their escape, and the country that she still misses. We don't know what our kids or our kids' kids will remember, or what will happen to the facts that we share with them. We can just hope that whatever they remember, they know that the truth is this, that our stories shape us, and then we shape our stories. And however those stories end up, as long as they're still here, so are we. Oh, 
奇声哇啦哆哇嘛哒噔的念，这哇的吉哎克里啦哆布拉多，都太的吉的呗，生活就找到。早先早把牙齿长大的，什么家都没得，就老不单吵，爱记得那的，就像我老都那么懂得伢子。就这里，让来到那这的北生活，就找到个爱不着。现在把多养起，长大到什么个呢？提提下我罗那。七八个么少了，早看都啊想那路得穿了那风来套件，大不了就想那早打那那早给风得风吃了。生在土地里，天下万乱。That was Pang Her Bang. She wrote that song herself just for this show. So, she's incredible, thank you.